צהריים טובים לכולם, קוראים לי דבי בן ארי ואני שמח קודם כל להיות פה, חלק מהאנשים גם, אני נחמד. נדבר איתכם היום באמת על כל הבאזוורד הזה של ביג דאטה מבחינה טכנולוגית וגם מבחינה שימושית, מה אפשר באמת לעשות ואנחנו נדבר, נחלק קצת את ההרצאה לכל מיני נושאים שבאמת יהיו בקונטקסט באמת לא רק של סתם לזרוק באזוורד, אלא באמת לתת משהו קצת יותר פעם. עכשיו, עם כל זה, הרצאה וכל הדברים האלה אני יכול לדבר בלי סוף, אני אשמח גם כאילו תוך כדי פשוט תעצרו אותי כאילו ישראלי, תשאלו שאלה. זה תמיד נחמד, תמיד נחמד לנהל שיח, מאשר סתם לשמוע אותי ולדבר במשך שעה ממש ממש מהר. אז נעשה אינטרודקשן מאוד מאוד קצר, קוראים לי דמי, כרגע אני אביא כאן איש של סטארט-אפ שנקרא פאנורייז. מה אנחנו עושים ממש במשפט? אנחנו עושים... אנחנו חברת ביג דאטה בעולם הסייבר, בגדול אנחנו עושים הערכת סיכון לחברות, לטיפות מבחוץ, ואנחנו עושים את כל ה-supply chain management. עוד כל מיני דברים שאני אעשה, נארגן קהילות מפתחים, קהילה של שנקראת ביג טינגס, שמתעסקת בביג דאטה, דאטה סיינס, דאב אופס, גוגל דבר גרופ שמתעסק בקלאוד, וגם קמתי את עמותת בוגרי אופק, שזו היחידה ששירתי בקצבה. לפני זה, בתפקיד הקודם שלי הייתי דאטה אינג'יניר בחברת מינגורט ובצבא, נורא מכל מקור, הייתי פרקטן, ראש צוות, ומערכת הגנת הגילים, ביחידה של דאטה פרופ. מה אנחנו נדבר היום מבחינת חלוקה של ההרצאה? אז אנחנו נדבר קצת על באמת מונחים בסיסיים בעולם הביג דאטה, נעשה נקודה שהם לכמה פרמורקים באמת שקיימים, שהם מאוד נפוצים היום בעולם, גם כאלה שהם טרנד יורד, גם כאלה שהם... טרנד קיים, ואולי גם קצת על דברים מתאים. נדבר קצת על הבאזורד הזה שנקרא אפאצ'י ספארק, ובאמת על רוב סטורי שהיה לנו גם בחברה הקודמת. מוניטורינג של כל הסיפור הזה, שזה מאוד מאוד חשוב, ונעשה סיפור של מסקנות בכל הסיפור הזה. אז בגדול כשאנחנו מדברים על טכנולוגיות של ביג דאטה, אז מתחילים לזרוק את כל הבאזורד האלה. מונגו די בי, סוג של מן דאטה בייס של ביג דאטה, לפי הטענה. הדור, שזה באמת אקו סיסטם שלם של כלים, שזה לא טכנולוגיה ספציפית, והרבה פעמים משתמשים בזה כי אני רוצה להכניס הדוק לחברה שלי. קסנדרה של דיסטריבטד דאטה בייס, הדלס, אפאצ'י ספארק, הדלי הזה זה בעצם ה-object storage של AWS שנקרא S3, וכל מיני טכנולוגיות כאלה שפתאום מתחילים לדבר בסקייל מאוד מאוד גדול, מתחילים לפזר בעצם את כל הדברים. אז בואו נדבר באמת על כל מיני מונחים. ואם שואלים אותי באמת מה זה ביג דאטה, אוקיי? ומה ההגדרה שאני רוצה לבוא ולהגיד, האם יש לי בעיה באמת שבעולם הזה, ברמה הזה של ביג דאטה, אני צריך לשאול את שאלת ה-3 Vs, אוקיי? יש כל מיני מודלים אגב שאומרים גם 5 Vs, 7 Vs, כל מיני כאלה, אבל אני מתמקד בשלוש שבאמת מעניינים. ווליום, ולוסיטי, ודברים. בעצם כמה דאטה יש לי, אוקיי? וזו שאלה שמאוד מאוד קשה לשאול. קשה מאוד לקבל תשובה עליה מכל ארגון, כי אם אני אשאל לכם בתור מפתחים, אגב, קצת חלוקה, בסדר? כמה מפתחים יש פה? אוקיי, כמה אנשי אופס? אופרשיינס, דב אופס, משהו באמצע? ואנשים מעולם הפרודקט, אני מניח, גם יש, גם QA, נכון? אוקיי, מגדיל. אז זו שאלה שמעניינת תכלס את כולם. כי על כל אחד זה משפיע בצורה אחרת, בסדר? על אופריישן זה משפיע מבחינת כמה תקנות תכלס יש, גם על אנשי הפרודקט זה משפיע מבחינת, לא יודע, התקדמות של המוצר, ומטריקות שהם רוצים, ו-API שהם רוצים להוציא מהסיפור הזה, ואנחנו מפתחים זה משפיע מן הסתם על קושי טכנולוגי להכניס מוצרים כאלה ואחרים. ולוסיטי, כמה, באיזה תדירות, מהירות אנחנו מקבלים בעצם את הדאטה הזה, וגם ורייב. אנחנו נכנסנו... אתה יכול לעבור לאנגלית, יש דוברי אנגלית פה שלא מדברים עברית. I speak English, but I can follow from your slides. <laughs> so. Okay, I really don't mind. English? Okay, so I won't start off in the beginning, but I will continue in English from now. Okay, so basically the third one that we've talked about, we've talked about velocity, uh, volume, velocity, and variety. And variety means that we've actually uh, arrived to an era in which we have uh, multiple uh, types of data sources, uh, we have data formats, and because of the variety, it's really hard uh, to ingest all of that data. Uh, we can talk not only about the 3D model, we can talk about the, let's say, main things that uh, define a big data system. 
mostly in multi-region availability that I need to disperse my system to different uh, availability zones. Very fast and reliable responses that are needed by our users over that amount of data. And basically no single point of failure. I want my system always uh, up and running. Uh, what we've had until now, uh, and now can be like 15 years ago, we, we mostly had, we, we had no SQL databases in the past, uh, but it wasn't that widespread. Mostly uh, all of our data was relational, okay? And we had uh, schema storage tables, we had cross table joints, everything was confined into a single machine and it was pretty easy, I won't say it's, it was very easy. We had the uh, acid model, okay, ethnicity, consistency, isolation and durability. Uh, but again, everything came at very high costs, mostly in performance and in hardware. So uh, let's say big data uh, table joints are really, really hard when you have like billions of rows. And lots of data, and it's dispersed in, on multiple machines. It's really complex and fragile. And basically, today, nowadays, we don't, in modern applications, we really don't have to confine ourselves to these uh, uh, really hard uh, atomicity and consistency requirements. Uh, what strategies actually help us to manage our big data? Uh, mostly to distribute all our data across multiple nodes and also the compute. Uh, do replication, basically this is our backups, okay? You can't back up a petabyte of information and then actually like think of that, restoring it in a reasonable time. Uh, we need to relax our consistency requirements that we've uh, mentioned in the previous slide. And we like schema requirements because most of our data is not relational, it's optical, okay? When we speak about like OOP, basically all of our objects can be confined in single objects and we don't have to do joins to like, write our uh, programs. And of course, we need to start thinking of optimizing the data according to our application and not like throw it in one single database and then like do transformations over it. Okay, just checking on the time. Awesome. So what's NoSQL? Not relational database? Yeah, it's unrelational <laughs> databases basically, and not only databases, but design models, but it's not only SPO, okay? And basically we have, uh, if we <coughs> separate them to two, uh, two or four uh, main families, we have the graph databases, in which we don't have the relation, uh, relational model, key value stores of many kinds, uh, object storage uh, also resides there, and document stores, JSONs that we store and wide column stores in which we store like multiple columns that can be up to hundreds and thousands of, of columns in a single row. Uh, and the three key factors in this, these kind of models are basically consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, in which we will see in the next slide the cat theorem. Okay? And what the nowadays databases uh, say that basically you can uh, follow only two constraints. Okay, uh, as they say in the cat theorem, you can't have a database that has all three. Uh, Google kind of invented one, uh, which is called Cloud Spanner, and they say that basically they broke the cat theorem. It's not exact, but it gives like great performance there. And you can see it, like multiple uh, families of databases, in which like, let's say we have availability and partition tolerance. Uh, has anybody used Cassandra in the past? Okay, so, you kind of relax consistency in uh, Cassandra, but you have what they call tunable consistency. You can have all three of them, but basically most of your queries will, will fail if you have a uh, consistency level of all. Uh, you have the databases that are consistent and partition tolerant. Let's say MongoDB can be sharded, so it, it is partition tolerant, but uh, the availability is much lower because you have a single point of failure at the master, and uh, when you want to write, you write through it. And you have the databases that have availability and consistency, but it's really hard to shard them. Let's say uh, Neo4j, which is a graph database, which is really, really hard to shard, and it's a really big problem in uh, uh, graph databases in general. Okay. Has any of you have seen this website in the past? DB Engines, okay? It's a really useful tool, which I use the most of the times when I need to choose technologies. Uh, you can actually compare uh, DB engines and their popularity 
and you can see how many actually use them. I won't say it's not like somebody is tempering that. Uh, it's not like 100% reliable, but basically you can get a lot of insights of which kind of databases these are. You can see the, like the ranking according to other databases, etc. Okay, we've spoken about DevOps. Uh, and let's define the, the whole concept. Basically, we had in the past, like again, 15, 20 years ago, a real separation between developers and operations, okay? Usually developers uh, used to like develop code and throw it on the operation team and they need to like take care of it when it's in production. Today, again, things became simpler, installations became simpler. Every develop developer today now tries to install the software. We have cloud, we have hypervisors, and basically all of the things are getting meshed up. So you have uh, cross-functioning teams, in which in every team you have uh, developers, QAs, uh, and DevOps engineers, sometimes even operations, and sometimes the product even uh, resides inside the team. Uh, I, I believe it's the right model to work in, but basically a new phrase and a new uh, profession came up, which is DevOps, of course. Okay, so this is like the, let's say, a summary of all of the basic concepts that we'll be speaking about in the, in the talk. So let's introduce some of the big data frameworks and a bit of the history of actually which, which of these tools actually came to life. Hadoop, we've spoken about Hadoop and what Hadoop is. It's basically uh, processing very large amounts of data, which in the past we couldn't store or wouldn't store because it was too costly. It was right now when we start storing it, maybe blogs or like event data, uh, stream data about IoT from like sensors, many, many unstructured things and really complex data in which we don't tamper in the, in the way before we store them. Uh, running on a large amount of machines, both in memory and on disk. And uh, running on cluster of machines, basically starting working together, but again, all of the data is, uh, is dispersed and partitioned. And everything, of course, should be like in pretty low costs, okay? And can you tell me what low costs are when they speak about like commodity machines? Throw me a number. Somebody. Okay. They're speaking about like machines of around $10,000 per machine, okay? And not like annual subscription of some kind that you buy like really, really big hardware. What are the core, the core principles of Hadoop? So basically it's flexibility, and scalability of the machines and your processes, low cost, which $10,000 is low compared to other things, and fault tolerance. Fault tolerant, uh, in which if something fails, basically the infrastructure should continue working, uh, should continue actually uh, and help the program uh, continue working. <coughs> okay, so the three main components of Hadoop is basically the HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System, which came from GFS, Google's white paper, which actually they took to the open source world, uh, the map the reduced paradigm, uh, have you heard of it? Awesome. And YAR, which came like the second version of MacReduce, uh, yet another resource negotiator. Uh, the problem that was in uh, Hadoop uh, version 1 was basically once you start running on, on the cluster of machines, uh, you take all the resources of the cluster. And basically you're blocking uh, all of the other uh, processes that want to work. And uh, YARN gave you the ability to actually control your resources. So it's really, really important. You have an application manager per application that you're running, and uh, it's preemptible. Basically, you can kill a job during the, its uh, whole process because it's blocking other jobs or, or like different kind of things. The Hadoop ecosystem, we said, the Hadoop is not a specific technology. It's an ecosystem of many, many things. So uh, once they gave the basic tools that we spoke about here in MapReduce, they wanted to implement like higher level APIs. Okay, so we have like Hive, Pig, which are like query languages and the data moving uh, abilities, HBase, which is a database on top of HDFS, Uzi, which is a, like a kind of scheduler over it, and many other things. Among them, it's sort of outside of the loop, but in all of the distributions, it's come with it, it comes with it, uh, which is basically a batch spark. Okay, so which kind of distributions do we have? 
Uh, the most common ones that are known here, here in Israel and the common ones in the world are basically Cloudera, Hortonworks, and MapR. But every cloud service provider basically provides some kind of infrastructure in which you can like ramp up a Hadoop cluster uh, out of the box. So uh, EMR has its elastic memory use. Uh, Google has its data proc. Uh, Azure has its own, uh, I think it's called HD Insights. And even uh, IBM has its own. Probably Oracle has its own right now. Uh, but some kind of odd distribution is data specs, in which they don't have the whole Hadoop ecosystem, but they have Cassandra, because data specs is the company that develops Cassandra. And they have integration with uh, uh, not HDFS, with Spark, and different kind of databases that they added. They like bought Titan to be their like uh, data specs graph, I think it's called, and uh, many other things, many other tooling that they have actually added to the distribution. The special thing in all of these things, that you have like some kind of deployment manager in which you deploy a single node, and then it kind of like installs your whole infrastructure. So if you have an on-premise installation, it's much easier to ramp it up and not like install vanilla Hadoop, which is really, really hard if you don't know it. Uh, it will be quite a long task to do. Okay, so when to actually choose it? We've kind of mentioned it uh, during the talk, but when we have large amounts of data, uh, how many can say like what's large? How big is your data? Okay, when you start talking about throughput that you need to, to take into your system, like, like let's say hundreds of gigabytes of data per a really short amount of time, it can be a matter of minutes and it can be a matter of hours, you start having some kind of a big data problem which you need to maybe store all the data, etc. So this is one use case, semi-structured data or unstructured data. And data which is not well categorized, which you will need to afterwards maybe uh, do some kind of processing. But basically, every use case that you don't know if the data might be useful and you don't need that online, maybe you will need that online, probably you will be able to store that because nowadays uh, hardware and storage became really, really cheap and you can basically do that. What, what in the past was really, really hard. Okay, so we are coming to Spark, okay? How many of you have heard about Spark? Okay, awesome. Uh, more than basically cool, I want to incorporate Spark in my organization, which many people say. Spark is not a magic tool, okay? It's not a silver bullet for everything. So it's also like Hadoop, uh, based on the MapReduce paradigm, and all of the API is basically based on the MapReduce one. Uh, I won't show that. If you want, you can search in YouTube. It's some kind of like the hello world of the big, uh, of the big data world is a word count. And uh, there is like a recording of me speaking for 11 minutes about how to do that in Spark. So if you want, you can search for that. But basically, this is the use case. Okay, we have lots of words dispersed in multiple machines. I want to aggregate all of the data and know how many words we have in each maybe document, which is like spread around, uh, across multiple machines. So what we do, we actually aggregate them uh, and sort them according to in a single machine and uh, point them to one. One is the count of every word. Afterwards, we reduce it into a lot of ones. We count the amount of ones and output the data into a single machine, uh, counting only the amount of every word that we have. Okay. okay, so after we spoke about the paradigm, what is actually Spark? Spark is, again, not a silver bullet. It's a general purpose uh, cluster computing framework. And uh, it does its computation in memory or on disk. It's tunable according to what you as developers define. And again, it has its low level infrastructure. I can run actual MapReduce jobs. And it has its higher level APIs, in which I can run actual SQL over this uh, infrastructure and maybe even graph computation, streaming. Okay, it's really, really important to. Uh, bring not only like low-level developers to the ecosystem or maybe data scientists. Community, okay, it's really important in every tool that we actually use. And the community since 2013, I think, that they actually released the Spark to Open Source has grown, I think, times two every year, even maybe more. And many, many big companies contribute to Spark. And because of that, it's like on a rise. Another really useful website that I use is uh, OpenHub. Any of you heard of it? Okay. 
really good. And uh, basically, uh, every open source tool that you use, you can search uh, this website and see the trends, which are really, really important. How many commits do we have? How many lines of code? How many comments according to the lines of code, etc. And many, many metrics. And you can see that Spark, like from, again, if you see the pointer, from 2013, it's just like multiply the amount of codes by two every like three months, which are the stable releases of Spark. And you can see here on the, on your right side, uh, the trend. But you can see it's kind of like going down in the high side. And again, a bit about the history of Spark. Basically, it was formed in uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and the main contributor is a company called uh, Databricks, which came out of the uh, doctorants in UC Berkeley. And Spark was actually like an example uh, of how to use a different kind of framework. Matthias Zakharai, which actually created Spark, he created the first uh, Mesos, uh, which is a scheduler for Docker containers, etc. And he said, I want to prove that uh, Mesos works. Okay, so how would I do that? I would actually create some kind of framework which works uh, on a distributed manner uh, over Mesos. And Mesos is a really good tool and open source one, but again, Spark took off by far much faster. Uh, the really important change, I think, uh, like comparing to Hadoop, is the interactive shell, in which in Hadoop you have to actually write code and test it on maybe like in unit tests and then deploy it on the cluster or like some kind of development cluster and then check it. Uh, in Spark you can do that interactively. So every piece of code that I write, I can actually like open up a, a venue real written Python maybe. Okay, awesome. So. The Python shell, you have the same equivalent to it in, uh, as by Spark. And you have the interactive shell of Scala. I think in even like new versions, they might incorporate the Java 9 uh, interactive shell, but I haven't used it. And the currently stable version of Spark is 2.2. They have a stable release every three months, and it's really amazing, uh, taking into account that it's an open source tool. So basically what we have in the whole ecosystem, we have everything inside one frame, okay? Everything to do compute. And we have batch operations, uh, the same thing that we had in the loop. We had streaming, okay? We can digest a lot of like incoming event data and we have the interactive shell, everything in a single unified, I won't say language, but at least a framework because we can use different languages. And how does the, like, the whole infrastructure look in uh, architecture manner? Okay, we have the Spark for libraries which are like the basic building blocks of Spark. Uh, we have MapReduce reviews over there, connectors, etc. We have higher, like intermediate level APIs, which are, which are called data friends. Any data scientists here, by the way? Okay, awesome. Uh, data frames are basically taking unstructured data and applying structure to them, okay? So it's basically converting unstructured data into tables. And uh, in like newer versions of uh, Spark, I think it was first one was 1.6 maybe, or 2.0, was introduced data sets, in which we uh, infer types to our data frames, basically. And we get we give much more uh, tools to do optimization over the higher level APIs, which are Spark SQL, GraphX, MLlib, which is a machine learning library, Spark Streaming, Spark R, and Spark Packages. Spark Packages is pretty like a unique one, because it's not a part of Spark, but it's kind of the open source toolbox that even you as developers, if you have some kind of database that you've developed, you can create a connector to uh, Spark in Spark packages and deploy it with your GitHub account. So it's pretty amazing. You will find a lot of examples there too, okay? So uh, it's a really good resource to, to see when you want, you want to start working with Spark. How long do you find? So half an hour, awesome. Uh, which are the languages? Okay, how many of you are Java developers? Okay, .NET framework, C++. Awesome. So who, who did this? Uh, basically, we have in the beginning uh, all the infrastructure in Spark were developed on with Scala. And basically, Scala is a JVM language in which you work with uh, Java libraries as well. So it was kind of Java and Scala. Uh, most of the code that I developed with Spark was with Java. I think more than 90% of the code. Uh, but again, to give uh, ability to data scientists and different kind of developers to Spark, they actually started developing more and more APIs. And after like the first versions, 1.0 and on, 
and they actually started stabilizing the APIs. So everything that you will find in Java, probably you will find a Python and it's Scala. Okay, it's a bit different because Java doesn't look like Scala. It's more like a, a it's not a functional, purely functional language, although they're actually trying to do that in uh, Java 9. And uh, in newer versions, of course, they started incorporating R as well because most of the data scientists that don't know how to code actually use R. So it's really important to give the ability to different kinds of developers to develop on the same infrastructure because the operation team or maybe the DevOps people install the Spark cluster in the organization. Everybody probably will, will want to use that because with power comes great responsibility. Okay, so the basic infrastructure and what are what is the the smallest model of the work, let's say, that we have in Spark is what's called an RDB. Okay, we will, learn, we will hear the phrase a lot of times. Resilient distributed data sets. So it's a shiny word to collections that are distributed, basically. Okay, so think of it as lists and maps that you work with every framework probably that you work with, uh, only distributed across a, a very large amount of machines or like even a single machine. And uh, you can see a very elaborate documentation there. They're really good at that as well. And uh, it's all of the, uh, how can I say, that? the infrastructure and the interface to work with all of these like uh, data nodes uh, and store the data and do all the transformations over them. Uh, the really important thing that uh, all of the resilient distributed data sets are lazy at value, okay? So basically I can run a Spark application uh, like a really long one, do lots of transformations and do lots of action, do lots of things, and for the program not to do anything, okay? Because I didn't do any action, I didn't trigger the calculation of the that, because everything is translated to a query plan and like a directed, a cyclic graph of what needs to be run. And the really important thing, every transformation and everything that I apply to the RDD, I take an RDD, I map it to something else, it creates a new RDD. Okay, so things are immutable. It's really important to remember because you can't change it. And it's really important because only because of the immutability, it can actually do the, uh, the DAG and compute things and optimize all of the operations. We can see that the transformations are like map, filter, and the actions are collect, count, reduce, and we have lots of different things. You can see that in the API, I really don't have time to go with it. So how it looks in memory. This is the real important thing because, again, I've spoken with words and that's it. This is the visual part, okay? All of the, like, the colors here are uh, different kind uh, of RDBs, okay? Different transformations. Let's say I started off with RDB1, did some kind of transformation, RDB2 was created, did another transformation, RDB3 was created. We can see the nodes, which are different machines, and the partitions are actually the division of the data across the nodes, okay? And you can see that everything is basically running in RAM. Okay? This is like the whole total of RAM of all of the machines together. But again, we, we said it runs in memory, but it can run on disk as well. How does it look infrastructure-wise, meaning in the machines? Okay? So basically, I have the basic component, which is called the driver. It runs in some machine. Okay? It can run in the machine that I actually run a command out of. Or in some machine in the cluster, it depends on the configuration. We have the Spark context, which is our control to the RDBs and the creation of the uh, running of the graph. And we have the workers in which the, uh, the work is dispersed to them, okay? So the smaller uh, chunk of actual computation is the task. Can somebody say where the data is? Because we'll talk about the computation right now. All over. Great answer. <laughs> it's correct. The data is distributed all, all over the data nodes, okay? But the thing is that uh, it's dispersed in memory. Uh, a Spark cluster doesn't have to run with an HDFS cluster, okay? So it can run if you have some kind of distribution which has installation of both of them, but uh, a Spark cluster can be detached from the actual storage area. This is a really important thing to remember because we'll talk about the tools right now. Uh, and we have the... the um, phrases of actually like wide transformations and narrow transformations. Narrow transformation actually means that if we have an inline of multiple uh, narrow transformations, the optimizer can actually take them, combine them into one, and really optimize the, the runtime of the whatever compute that you want to run. But 
when we have Y dependencies, which we do like joins, uh, some kind of combinations of group by that we do in databases, it's much more expensive because we actually take the data, we shuffle it in some kind because of that is the phrase shuffling, and transport it into a different uh, bunch of machines or a single machine. Okay. Time to have. Uh, we have that so we'll talk about a work story that we've had because right now I've like waved my hands with technology and buzzwords, uh, but let's connect it to the real world. Uh, a work story that we had that incorporated uh, some tools: Spark, Mongo, Cassandra, all running on AWS, and uh, we'll define maybe the problem in, in the short manner. Uh, we had a shipping company basically, okay? It was a big data company, which is called Windward. Uh, work there, and uh, we handled lots of uh, data points in the world, which actually meant that there is some kind of object on the sea. Okay? In the sea. Um, so we needed to digest all of the data, compute things, and basically say where all the ships are in the world. What we've had infrastructure wise, how many of you have, have used AWS or some kind of cloud service for in the past? Okay, awesome. Yeah, we have it. So uh, I'll just define the, the, the machines that you will see that. We had a standalone Spark cluster. We started off with that. Uh, five nodes, R3 extra light, they are like memory intensive uh, instances. Uh, we didn't want to keep a persistent HDFS mostly because of cost, because uh, we need to keep the machine live for HDFS to hold the data. And uh, uh, keeping these machines, these kind of machines on the cloud can be really, really costly. Single machine, uh, in a yearly cost, can cost like $2,000, something in the middle. And when you have a cluster of $100, it's, uh, 100 machines, it's really expensive. And uh, because of that, we didn't want to keep all the machines alive all, all the time. So we ditched the HDFS in the beginning and started working with S3, which is the object storage of AWS. <coughs> we cut the cost like to, to an amazing account. We had like 100 gigabytes of data per day. 150 terabytes of, of data around like the raw data for four years, and uh, basically we cut the cost to $210 per month. Okay, so it's pretty amazing when you when you st when you talk only about the data storage layer, and everything was still stored in the HDFS form. Okay, which is like some kind of protocol. S3N is the the native protocol of S3 uh, bucket, which is like the uh, Again, it's a bucket of data, it's a bucket of keys. And uh, the whole end of the string is basically some kind of key which you see as a maybe directories. Okay, so we solved the storage layer and uh, everything is uh, what's called 2D. Uh, what about the serving? Because right now we, st we store large files and it's not endless and we can't access the data in a single data point that we'd like. So we need some kind of index database, right? So what's like the common database that I will take for it to be easy? Mongo, okay? MongoDB is a great database for everything, but it's not good for anything, okay? Uh, this is the main issue there. So we had a relatively small cluster of uh, Apache Spark uh, nodes, and when it was like 10 machines, it was pretty okay, it could digest everything. We had a replica set of three nodes uh, of MongoDB, and everything was great. But what happens when you have 100 servers uh, writing these kind of servers, the R3 extra large, 4 CPUs, uh, 30.5, I don't know why it's 0.5, okay, I have no clue. This is how it comes from Amazon. Somebody can explain that, it would be awesome. Uh, and the storage was ephemeral, and we had like 10 plus, and once we started growing with over 10 machines, it became pretty horrible, okay? The, again, caveat, the Mongo servers were 2.6, it was like, two and a half years ago, I think, and uh, everything really improved with WireTiger, the new storage engine, etc. But again, this was the use case. We had like 15 gigabytes of RAM in each machine, four CPUs, uh, the storage was EBS, it was uh, like an attached storage and not SSDs. And we had around, in the beginning, around like 500 gigabytes in, the, in a single collection with five compound indices. This is like the scenery, okay? We have bad jobs that should run for 5 to 10 minutes in total, and it actually ran for 40 minutes. It was really bad. Uh, why? It's a good question. It was 20 minutes only writing the, with the Java driver, uh, asynchronously, unacknowledged, which is the weakest uh, way, 
and 20 more minutes for it to sync its journal into the database. And for 40 minutes, the whole database and the whole system wasn't responsive. Okay, because you were writing with a single, like handling with a single process, and nothing was being served to the UI. It's pretty horrible. So this happened before a showcase that we've had, and we needed to find some kind of solution in around two weeks. Okay, for the, for the whole system to function. Some kind of alternative solutions that we have. Okay, uh, have any of you used a sharded Mongo in the past? Okay, so it's basically taking the infrastructure of Mongo and sharding it like, into uh, across like multiple uh, partitions. Okay, every replica set is a different partition that holds a subset of the data. The process, okay, it actually increases the throughput and the amount of shards. You, as long as you add more shards, you have get more throughput. It's awesome. Increases the availability of the database because the Mongo S, the, the actual process, uh, only uh, accesses the relevant uh, shards and the relevant data. Cons: It's very hard to manage DevOps. Files, okay, it's, it's hell. Resharding Mongo is pretty, really hard, and it's a really high cost of servers because you have a replica set which are three servers. You can do that with two in an arbitrary, but uh, please multiply that across the amount of shards that you need. So basically, if you need a uh, higher throughput, it will be really, really costly. And not always you can scale with all of these servers if you're on premises. So this is basically how it will look. Okay, The amount of masters that you'd like, and you still kind of have the single point of failure of the master. Okay, So let's say, again, you will have this uh, deployment of many, many nodes of Spark writing right, right to the specific uh, Mongo S's. Another alternative solution, it's Apache Cassandra. Okay? Again, pros, we have a very large developer community. It's kind of a linearly scalable database, and I say linearly because it's not really linear, but it's some kind of linearly. Uh, no single master architecture, which is really great when you don't have the confinement of that. And it's actually proven working with Apache Spark with previous companies. This was in the, I think, beginning of 2015. Cons, we have no experience with the database at all. Okay? We have no clue, we didn't deploy it ever. And we didn't have any geospatial index, which is which was really important for our queries because many things are geographic. Okay, basically I need to know where the ships at. So it's really hard. Basically, what was the solution is try to deploy as fast as possible at Cassandra Cluster, which was the easiest way with, uh, with uh, the distribution of data stacks to the AMI. AMI is basically an image of a virtual machine that you deploy to Amazon. And look back, it's not, it wasn't that good of a choice, but it worked for the beginning because uh, even data stacks say that uh, it's not uh, recommended to deploy that in production, but again, it worked. So who cares? Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, we used the Spark Cassandra connector, uh, which gave us really like ramp up time from zero to hero uh, in a great uh, time manner. Uh, but it didn't give us much control at that time because they added much more functionality in 2016 and 17. But then it was pretty good time, and we created a kind of monitoring dashboard because when you have a database which is really dispersed in multiple machines, you need visibility over that. Okay, because if you don't have any visibility, probably the things will fail and you don't know shit. Okay, the second phase was actually creating a self-managed provision for Sandra Cluster, which was really hard. Okay, uh, let's say in two weeks we came up with a solution that was pretty awesome, but it was pretty awesome. And that's it. Then we needed in the next like, three or four months to tune that uh, Sandra Cluster. It, was, it wasn't that easy. And we ran into more problems. Okay, the workflow with Cassandra looked like this: we had a cluster of machines, Apache uh, Spark cluster, uh, which did the compute, and we took the data from S3 and basically after the compute, saved it into Cassandra to be able to uh, query single chips. Okay, uh, everything with a, with a, like no master architecture, so I can write to every node and it will redirect me to the relevant node. Uh, so basically, what was the result? Okay, we had a, a process that ran for 40 minutes, and we downscaled it to three minutes. Okay, so it's pretty amazing with three nodes of Cassandra comparing to three nodes of um, uh, MongoDB or maybe like a, a really high, higher costly uh, deployment that we could have had. Uh, it went down to three minutes, and it took around like two weeks to 
come out from zero to hero and not a production, real production system. Uh, and it was really good. Without, it actually worked in the showcase without any glitches. Uh, one node failed at night because it was in Singapore and we woke up a bit later. And, and nothing happened. We didn't have any data loss. So it's pretty big. By the way, most of the deployments of Cassandra shouldn't be three nodes. It should be a, a multiplication of twos. Uh, but again, it's recommendations. Who cares as long as it works? So again, we've solved some problems. What's the problem again? Okay. The heaviest process of, of the whole system, the fusion process, uh, it's a microservice that uh, should run in every 10 minutes. Uh, it writes around 30 gigabytes of data per iteration, and you have the replication factor of three because of that. We've spoken about in the NoSQL world, we don't have backups, we have replicas. So basically, I need to write 90 gigabytes of data every 10 minutes. And at first, it took like around 18 minutes to write the whole process. Pretty unacceptable because you're starting to lag. This is how the sample cluster in monitoring looks just before everything starts to die. Okay? Everything is red, and then it becomes gray, and then you lose data. <coughs> so it's not that nice. So what was actual, the actual solution to that? We started tuning everything. Okay? So we chose a, a higher spec uh, instances, which were like optimized to work with disks, i 2 x just We optimized the cluster in the infrastructure and in the operation system. We changed the JDK, which is the real recommendation. Everything comes with the, an open JDK 7. It used to come that way. And the recommendation, of course, is to run with Java 8. Uh, changing the GC algorithm to G1 did wonders, OK? And tuning the operation system, and putting up the U limits, removing the swap, which is really, really dangerous, because if you remove the swap in Linux, the operation system can die. Never happened. And uh, the write time went down from 18 minutes to 5, okay, with a replication factor of 3. Sounds great, right? And this was basically how the, the infrastructure looked like. Uh, you can see here, uh, these are the CPU, which is like in 100%. You can see the disk operations, which is like uh, 10,000 IOPS per second. It really pushed it, okay? And this was the improvement. So basically, we took the solution of taking all of the data that we put in Cassandra, okay, taking the same data model and writing it the same way into S3, which is a surprise, was actually much faster, okay, because it's probably more distributed. We can get to the same performance and even better probably with Cassandra, but again, it's value to money, okay, and basically to have a Cassandra cluster large enough to do that, we need to pay a lot of money. And we went down from five minutes to one and a half minutes, which is pretty great when you have a process of 10 minutes, you need some compute, you will have probably some hiccups, but you will still fit into 10 minutes. So, reads from F3, downscales the amount of writes to them, then writing to send write to serve. Okay, this was the actual like end goal solution to still have the pinpointing uh, uh, options. And it was great. This is how it actually looks. Okay, we took, took the raw data, uh, we processed it to Spark, analyzed all the data layers, uh, and put the static data, the insights out of it into Mongo. The heavy process read, uh, had written the data to S3, and then we had another process to <coughs> downscale all of the data. Why can we downscale the data? It's pretty simple, okay? A ship usually, usually moves from point A to point B, but across this path, you actually have multiple data points in the, in the middle. You don't need it. Okay, you need only A and B, and basically you can downscale the data by sometimes even 50%. And of course, everything was being served from, Mong from Mongo and Cassandra to the UI servers uh, with no changes. Okay. Awesome. We have like 10 minutes. Um, distributed systems and the problems that emerge out of it. By the way, do you know what animal this is? R. Uh, most of the systems start off as a model. Okay, every MVP that we start, every POC that we start, start off like this. We have uh, the operation system, which we have the CPU, memory, and disk. We have the processes layer, which databases are basically processes as well. Java servers, application servers of some kind, web servers. On top of that, we can have like hardware load balancers or software load balancers. And of course, we have other user applications that might interact with our system or run on our infrastructure as well. Everything is monitoring, basically. 
Okay? And in these kind of solutions, what we have is are like real monitoring systems with the UI that we show. Many times, all of this runs on a single server. Then all is okay. But what happens when you have a distributed microservices architecture? It's hard. Okay? It gets much harder, especially when you have like some service A, which has its own database, writes in some kind of queue, you have service B, on top of that you have a cache that sits on top of the database, everything reports to some kind of web server, or service C, maybe you have another cache, another database, you have an analytics cluster, and what's the more complex thing is basically that team A might be in charge of service A, team B will be in charge of service B, and team C will be in charge of all the rest. Okay, who does the monitoring? Probably no one, okay, this is the solution most of the times so and you don't have any visibility, but you should. So again, we've talked about the kind of infrastructures that we have. We have multiple machines running with Spark, uh, running with Mongo, maybe running with Cassandra, maybe serving, we have many more web servers and UI clients that we need to show and maybe like uh, evaluate the performance of really, really hard. So problems. We have multiple physical servers, multiple logical services. We want to do scaling. Scaling is awesome, right? That actually means more servers. And uh, even if you have all of the metrics, you have an overflow of data. And basically, your monitoring problem becomes a big data problem, okay? Which is really, really hard at setting. This is how DevOps people look like when they tackle this kind of problems. Okay, it's not that nice. So, monitoring is crucial, right? What do we monitor? And this is the good question for every, everybody, I think, in the software development world, okay? It's not only developers, it's not only operation people, it's also product people and business people even. We have the most common one that we know, that everybody knows, we need to monitor our infrastructure, right? If the servers are running, everything is good. But what happens when you start having data on top of that infrastructure? You need to monitor your data if everything is corrected, right? If everything exists, basically, if all of the computation actually occurred. And on top of the data, out of that you get insights, right? So you want to know like where to move your product to, like uh, where to take it, what add extra features to have. Another important thing to monitor, and basically business. Okay, how do you monitor business? You need to define some kind of KPI. We know what KPIs are key performance indicators. Okay? The, 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 the nicest KPI that I saw was in a specific company that I came to. I saw a big screen showing only one number. Okay? What is that number? The amount of money the company makes. Okay? And as long as that number is ticking up, everything is A okay. When something stops, there is a problem. Okay? It's a really nice one to see. <laughs> Try to find your own ones there. Okay. Monitoring the operation system. Again, we've spoken about the all of the layers, so it's really important, right? And you can use the different like Linux or Windows tools to monitor that, and speaking still all of that. Uh, even Mac, it's really common like, uh, like Linux. And it's mostly per node, okay? But again, you can aggregate all of the data, all of the operation system metrics, and see which servers are lagging or which servers are weaker, uh, the slow runners, let's call them some help from the cloud. So if you're not running on-prem, uh, you will have many tools that plug and play with your uh, infrastructure, with your VMs. Uh, you have that on, on, on OpenStack too, probably, but again, it's much harder to, to configure. Uh, so on AWS, you have uh, CloudWatch, and on GCP, on Google Cloud Platform, uh, you have StackDriver. And uh, StackDriver was a company which actually was acquired by Google. It's part of the platform right now. It's pretty awesome. You just like click two buttons, say I am willing to pay, and that's it. Everything is being reported to StackDriver uh, from Docker containers which run on Kubernetes and uh, logs and every metric that you want on your uh, cloud machines as well. Um, okay, so report to where? It's the real important thing because you want to see that. You want to see that graphically. So this is a solution that you can actually use in your own prem and even like on your machines uh, to visualize all the data, okay? So what we used to do at Windward, and even in this com uh, my company right now, and many other companies, are using Grafana, okay? It's a great visualization tool over some kind of data source. Grafana plugs into Graphite, InfluxDB, Prometheus, uh, Elasticsearch, it even plugs into CloudWatch, and they actually develop many more, more plugins there. 
Monitoring Cassandra. We've spoken about Cassandra, distributed database, many nodes, we need that too. So basically what they had offered in the past as an open source was Op Center, DataStax Op Center. It was pretty great. Plug and play zero to zero, it's great. But it's not customable. You can't add like custom metrics. So we implemented a kind of hybrid solution in which you have agents that report to Op Center. You have uh, other kind of agents that uh, report it was like internal agents from Java that report to Influx or Graphite, depending to the throughput. And we had some we had some kind of solution. And I won't say about more stories, but I managed to kill with Cassandra and Graphite you know, because I tried to report nine million metrics in one second. Not smart. Okay, but don't do that. Monitoring Spark. So we have multiple tools to monitor Sparks as well. We have the Spark UI that comes out of the box. We have the Spark History Server, which you need to. Um, uh, like configure and every application, every bad job, everything that finishes, uh, writes its output to there and you can like historically uh, monitor your uh, services. Spark REST API, in which you can programmatically query the uh, running application and uh, resolve its state, how many nodes you have. It's really great. And of course, back to the basics, you can do DSTAT, IOSTAT, IOTOP, JSTAT, which are tools that come out with Linux and chat. Um, monitoring today. Okay, and what's the data? Basically, we need to ask these kind of data questions, okay? Did all of the computation occur, and do you have any uh, data layers missing? How much data do we have? We started off with that question in the beginning. And is all of the data in the database? Because, like, I can't do count star on, like, 10 petabytes of data. Okay, it will be pretty hard. You can, you can sometimes do that with BigQuery, but you'll pay a lot of money. So, basically, you arrive to a new phrase that a friend of mine had defined, data quality assurance, okay? And it's really, really important to know that once you start handling lots of data. So, data answers. The method is basically asking the questions, <coughs> answering with metrics, okay? And uh, answering with actual monitoring over your data. Know your data flow, because things will fail, okay? It's not right. Um, do it easy to monitor, okay? Because if it's really hard, who's lazy? I'm lazy. Okay, as developers, you're always lazy, and if something is hard, nothing will be done. Okay, and think of it as a really key point. It's not the DevOps fault, okay? Once you develop something, take ownership over it. And every deployment in production, you should actually know that. Because if you don't know that, you don't care, and probably you will have the same problems over and over again. Logging. Who does logging? Who doesn't do logging? Okay, come on. <laughs> And basically, you need to log a lot, and uh, you have many, many other different kind of solutions. ELK, Elasticsearch, Block Session, Kibana. You have hosted solutions and cloud service providers. You have many, many other things. Use it. It looks cool. Like, I can actually look at these graphs all day long and monitoring graphs. It's pretty weird, I know, but, but still. <laughs> when you look at a monitoring stack, you need to take into account all of these things. Okay, basically, you will probably need to a tool or something or some kind of solution for every and uh, each and one. Metric collection, you will need to do some kind of data monitoring. Everything should be stored in some kind of data store. You will need some kind of dashboards to actually see what's happening. You, need, you will need log monitoring. And of course, what's important to actually show the metrics if, it, if you can't do anything on top of it. So you need alerting, okay? And again, the real important thing that developers used to, like, over abuse is over alert, okay? If you send an email for every uh, failed uh, message, basically what you will do as a developer afterwards, after like five minutes, you will do a rule in your email which actually deletes the, the email each time, okay? So what you can't respond to, and if, you, if the solution is restart, then do automatic restart, okay? I know it's not a good solution, most of the times you will like, fail in the, in the end, but Still, think of it that alert on things that you actually can respond to. So, again, are we there yet in the big data world? So, again, you need to ask the basic questions of how much data do you have? How fast is the data coming? And what kind of data do I have? Like the variety. And if the answer to these questions is yes, probably you're in some kind of data problem. And uh, think again if you want to add complexity with your big data. So conclusions. 
Be careful if you go into the big data pool. You can save data, but you don't have to do everything real time. Uh, and again, it's not a silver bullet for anything. Basically, you will need to think about every kind of solution that you go to to know if you actually need all of this tooling because this is complex, okay? You need a lot of experience to start working with these kind of things and basically take the subset that actually solves the problem that you're trying to solve. A problem is not, I want to have big data in my organization, okay? It's a really stupid like uh, management decision that you want to work with bot cards. And take measurements of everything. Automate everything because we're lazy. What we don't automate, we don't do. And having clusters and distributed frameworks will cost a lot eventually. Think about these kind of considerations as well. And of course, fit storage there that you actually need. Okay? Mongo won't solve everything. Cassandra won't solve everything. No storage layer probably will solve everything. After speaking really, really fast, I actually made it with 90 slides. I still can't believe it. Um, any questions? Thank you, Demi.